W. Well, that's how the weak force, beta decay is through a weak nuclear force. Notice the proton, the, the quarks are still in there, they're still bound. So the strong nuclear color chromo, what do they call it, chromodynamic, the strong nuclear color force is still holding the quarks together, but the weak nuclear force is what's accounting for the beta decay, which via the W minus particle, it's actually a particle that's carrying this force, streamlines into the proton, two ups and a down, the electron, antineutrino, you see them down here, that's the byproduct, so now when it's out, now they're going like that. I really wonder if they go opposite directions or if they go together or if one goes up because all the drawings I've seen here have them kind of going at like a 45 degree angle. So at least these are showing quarks. I can't get too upset about that. Here's a little history of the neutrino because they were kind of wondering exactly what was going on. So here it was in 1934, Enrico Fermi was the first one to really find that there was something with the electron that was, I believe it was the spin was what the consideration was. Everybody talked about the neutrino being massless, so it had to conserve one of the other fundamental forces was the intrinsic spin for the quantum mechanics to work. But here it had it all coming out of one point. Then, this guy, I have to admit, I never heard of, maybe it's two guys, Oscar was the last name, Oscar Klein beta decay theory. Four years later, in 1938, this has the W as an intermediate. So the quarks change color. This is before they knew about the quark. They're just saying it goes from a neutron to a proton. They knew that. They didn't know the quark thing going on, but all they saw was when the heavier, more massive neutron decayed to the less massive proton, the amount of mass that was ejected was the electron. Well, in order to conserve spin, the antineutrino was proposed. So this was the mechanism now, different from Fermi's four years later, where all particles were emitted at the same time. The quark will actually change its color flavor, as they call it. It will change its identity, as far as I'm concerned. It goes from an up, from a down, to an up. It will be in decay. I'm so used to doing the fusion. This is fission when it's going that way. So our next thing that they had here, the weak nuclear force. This is how you would draw a Feynman diagram of this. six feet long. Why do I need the box over there? What are you doing? You're spo everybody gets smaller. See, this is a 20-year-old print photo. You don't want to go negative. You want to go negative to zoom. Okay, well, that's called a Feynman diagram, and that ain't going to happen here. Here's our Feynman diagram again, but I'm afraid to make this thing bigger. For you real nuke heads, I guess we'll call you, positron electron is an annihilation. When it creates a gamma ray, they say it'll go through an X naught neutral current back to a W plus to a W minus, which will then decay to an anti-quark and a quark and a neutrino and a positron. 
So whenever the positron, positive electron, it's going to be a real matter neutrino. The W naught here, remember before the W naught was carrying the force to go make the electron and the antineutrino. Here, the W naught particle can go form a anti-quark quark pair. Now, how this can do that is because there's conservation of mass. If you make a matter particle, you make the equal and opposite antimatter, the laws of mass conservation are not broken. And they were predicting this before they could prove it. Now they've proved it, and it's called pair production. And we find that now because whenever we make matter, if you go through the SLAC, the Stanford Linear Accelerator, up there under Route 280 going through the Bay Area, they're creating B particle quarks, anti-Bs. They're doing matter-antimatter collisions. The mass of a B quark alone is almost 3,000 times the size of a proton. So, matter, antimatter, whenever they make matter, equal and opposite antimatter. So, the question in cosmology nowadays is where's all the antimatter? Everything in the universe that we can see or taste, feel, smell, touch, breathe, think about is matter. Every time we make it, it's pair production. So, where is the antimatter? I heard a good theory that all matter and antimatter, when it's split apart, is tied by a string. This is different than your super symmetric string theory stuff. But matter, antimatter, if it's tied by what's called a graviton, the further apart the matter, antimatter gets, the smaller the string and the force between it, but it's still bound in this space and time forever. So God is out there with all the strings and the antimatter. He's able to pull the world like a marionette. Fits the physics. This I did just because I think the picture looks cool. There's actually something they call a double beta decay. A double beta decay. Decay. <laughs> If you've got a big nucleus, it wants to get rid of some neutrons. It's got too many neutrons. Double beta decay. It'll kick out through the W particle there. Matter, antimatter, electron, antineutrino. A neighboring particle can do the same thing. And what they measure is this angle, both on the same side. This might be one of those halos again. Maybe there's two neutrons surrounding in a halo, and they both decide to decay. Because remember, a proton that's not bound to a neutron, 20-second half-life. So if you have a new neutron doing the halo thing where it's a ways out there from the nucleus, what's holding it together? Maybe the spin and all that. So once one goes, maybe the other goes. So we've proved now that there are halos of neutrons. They even found a proton halo, two protons circling the nucleus, way out there, almost like an atom. So a double beta decay. How's that? Two betas coming out. I like it because of the W particle here, when it shows the scraggly lines, it's almost got a three-dimensional thing to it because everything is so two-dimensional. They take all the fun and the life out of it. This stuff is happening, okay? There's energy moving, and it looks so dull and boring. At least this is colorful. I hope they're showing red for protons and blue for neutrons. Here we are. This was where we were leading. This, my friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. The standard model of quark theory. Chromodynamics, they call it. There's color to these charm, strange, up, down, top, bottom quarks. The color is just a name that they give. Flavor, there's all kinds of different names. I wish they'd have stuck with truth and beauty for the top and bottom. Remember before they really proved them and found them? 
I don't know who got a hold of the naming scheme, but they sure took all the beauty out of it.